Oh, I was supposed to say I was obsessed with design and not my own midlife crisis. Oopsie. <laughs> Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with Jonathan Courtney, the CEO and founder of one of the most well-known innovation agencies in the world, AJ and Smart. He's also author of The Workshopper Playbook. He and his company have helped companies like Twitter, Google, Procter & Gamble, Lego, Mercedes-Benz, the UN, and many others solve problems through the power of workshops. So here to tell us about his journey from the classical agency to AJ and Smart, please enjoy this conversation with Jonathan Courtney. Okay, kids, all the way from Berlin, I'm chatting with Jonathan Courtney. Jonathan, Hello. welcome to Obsessed Show. Hi, how's it going, Josh? Oh, it's going well. It's great to see you. Yeah, great to see you too. I like your uh, kind of funky microphone setup you got there. It looks like a proper professional podcasting scenario. Yes, likewise. It's all the uh, all the hours. I'm sure like you have YouTube researching the right microphone and arm. And <laughs> I think I spend way more time researching all of this stuff than actually doing the content. I mean, it's the best way to procrastinate is like, <laughs> you know, what's the best pen you can buy? What's the best notebook? I'm obsessed with stationery. I'm obsessed with weird tech. I keep changing around my keyboard as well. I actually ended up going back to the normal Apple one after <laughs> buying like 10. Um, you got to procrastinate on buying stuff. Uh, so you don't actually have to do stuff. That's my number one rule. Well, it turns out I'm a self-diagnosed Enneagram 5, which is like the the super researcher type. I don't oh. know if you're an Enneagram follower, but... Uh, I don't know what that is. Yeah, it's it's one of these 800 different personality tests oh. that... Um, yeah, check it out. Starts with an E, Enneagram. Enneagram. Um, okay. Yeah. I want to know. I love figuring, I, I do a lot of these personality test things and I, I always just agree with them. You know, I always just 100% agree with the results. I don't know if it's like a horoscope thing where they're so generic. They're like, you're an extroverted introvert. Okay. I guess I suppose I'll go for that. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Done. <Nailed> <laughs> yeah. Life <laughs> complete. Well, just a few minutes in, I'm thinking you could be a five as well. Oh yeah. Um, Good. So as we're recording here, you know, we always release these a couple weeks, sometimes months after, after the conversation. But I could just be dead to, by the time this goes out. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> we both could be really famous yeah. or dead or I don't know. Hopefully both. <laughs> right. <laughs> Those things are more likely to coincide than one off. Um, <laughs> so it is, uh, it's that July. Is <laughs> <laughs> it's July of 2020. And there's this, this is a little thing called COVID. Um, how are you guys doing in Berlin? Like, what are, what are things like there? I, I, you know, so as you know, I work with mostly American companies and I'm based here in Berlin. Um, also do a, a weekly podcast with an American friend of mine. And I kind of feel bad because there's nothing going on here. It, everything's back to normal. The lockdown has been over oh, for that's amazing. two months now. Uh, restaurants have been open for two months. Um, the general vibe is really positive. Um, and Germany handled it really well. It's not to say that COVID is gone. It's just going to be continuing on for probably quite a long time. Um, but it's really under control. We never had any hospital overwhelm. It didn't cause sort of like a rift in pol politics. Um, we're all back in the office and everything's back to normal. Um, obviously, the new normal, you know, we have masks when, when you're working at the office here and um, some of the bigger companies in Berlin uh, can't go back until 2021 because of legal issues and just having thousands of employees. But we're, you know, a tiny boutique agency. We're all back. Everything's normal. And the uh, dark apocalyptic vibe lifted probably about two months ago. That's awesome. Yeah. So you guys have been out for two months already. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's awesome. Like I'm going to... Uh, dinner tonight with a group of like eight people to a restaurant to also drink alcohol and have fun. Right. And that's, it's been like that already since uh, sometime in May. Yeah. And sit inside and everything. Yeah. Inside. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm still at the outdoors only <laughs> for the, <laughs> for the restaurant situation, but uh, yeah, that's, that's maybe a glimpse into our future. I'm hopeful we'll, hopeful, we'll be there hopefully. here shortly. Right. Where are, you, where are you based? I'm in the Indianapolis area. So Indianapolis. kind of smack dab in the middle of the Midwest. Mm, okay. It's like just south of Chicago. Oh yeah. Right. I was in Chicago this, uh, 
this year. That was actually my last trip. It was Chicago and Nashville. Uh, it was such an amazing trip. That was in like February and then everything shut down. Mm, right. Yeah. Craziness. Um, well, I, I want to get into AJ and smart and your, and your new book, but also, um, I kind of want to do a little deep dive into you as well. So oh. tell us a little bit about your origin story. Well, um, some of you listening will realize that I'm Irish. Uh, I grew up in Ireland for the first it's 20 years. not a very years. German accent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I grew up in Ireland for the first 20... My wife is German. I'm allowed to mock the German accent. Um, actually, everyone's allowed to mock the Germans, okay? So it's it's all good. So I grew up in Ireland uh, <laughs> first first 20 years of my life. Um, kind of like a total nerd, really into I want, I, like animation. Uh, I was like a comic book artist. Um, I was, uh, also like obsessed with design. I was making people's websites. I was just like a nerdy tinkerer. Um, uh, I ended up going to college doing something called digital media production, which is like a course that has photography, filmmaking, animation, game design, all of that. So like just a bullshit course basically, but really fun for people like <laughs> me who don't know what the hell they want to do. Um, and in the second year, oh, I was also trying to be in a famous band during college. Um, and I was very, very convinced that we would be a famous band. So I actually moved my band to convince my band to move to London halfway through college. Um, <clears throat> and then they all got, they were all too intelligent and said, wait, maybe we should finish college. And I was like, oh, I don't want to finish college. Let's be a famous band. And then I heard that I could actually finish college in another country, which sounded more fun to me. So at least I was going to go <laughs> to another country. So moved to Germany, uh, finished my two years there, got obsessed with filmmaking, decided to be a filmmaker, moved to Berlin, um, where everyone in my class was moving to go work at agencies to be a famous filmmaker. And um, the only way I could uh, like pay for my famous filmmaking career was by doing kind of the only job you could make money uh, with in Berlin. And that was being a designer. And luckily, I already learned how to be a designer in uh, college. And so I realized then... So I got a job as a UX designer. Actually, it was like back those, back in those days, 10 years ago, it was like web designer. Right. Um, so I became a web designer. And um, you know, one thing led to another. I quit that job. Um, myself and another one of the employees there decided to start our own agency um, to make apps. So an app design agency. And oh, that fancy. agency <laughs> is AJ and Smart. <laughs> oh, you guys called ago. it that from the start? We called it that uh, from the very start, actually, because it was just like a really, we had to make a really quick decision um, for the tax authorities. And we just, it was actually three co founders and Alex, Jonathan, and Michael Smart. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I'm the only one left. <laughs> They're all alive. <laughs> They're all alive. It's not dark. You're the last one left standing. Yeah. So, um, that was going to be my follow-up question was how AJ and smart came to be. So that was like your, your quick formation of this yeah. app design company. Well, I guess the formation might be interesting for people listening because a lot of people, um, ask me this question. So I was working in this company, like I said, and, um, it, uh, my co-founder, one of my co-founders, Michael, he was freelancing there. And one day he came to me and he said, Hey, I've got this freelance project. That's actually quite big. Um, maybe you, you and I could do that together. And I was like, Oh yeah, I can probably freelance while also doing this full-time job. Um, and he was like, yeah, they want us to like code something as well. And so I asked the bass player in my band who also moved to Berlin. Um, and he was like, oh, I could probably learn how to do that. And so we pitched. It was actually for the German government, the uh, ger uh, the Ministry for the Environment, um, and I guess like not a lot of people had pitched for the project or something, or maybe the timeline was too short and other agencies didn't want it, or maybe the price was too low. Whatever. Anyway, we got the job. Um, we did the job in <laughs> one month, and it was crazy because I was still doing my full time job. Alex was still doing his full time job. Michael was still doing his full time job, and we were basically sleeping at the um, government office because we had no office, and they had a room that we were able to use all day, all night uh, for one full month. It was crazy, but it was super fun. Uh, and at the end, this is how the company formed. It's, it's still not a company at this point. It's three freelancers. At the end, we handed in three invoices to the, um, the government office and they said, Hey, you guys pitched as a company. We can't take three invoices. We can only take one invoice. And so we were like, oh yeah, no problem. We're a company and um, went, went <laughs> oh, to yeah, the... Oh yeah, we just forgot. <laughs> yeah, we just forgot that we're a company. Went to the um, what's called a Finance Amp where you register a company. Um, 
just in uh, sitting outside it really quickly, like, what will we call it? Because we didn't care about a company. We, we thought we we're going to shut this down as soon as we got paid. Um, and it was like between Jam, Jonathan, Alex, Michael, and AJ and Smart. Chose AJ and Smart because it sounded more expensive, um, like more like a law firm, and also it didn't matter. Uh, and so we just went in, called it AJ and Smart, and that was it. And then the bass player left pretty much immediately because he was like, well, I have a real job. And myself and Michael decided, ah, okay, that was fun. Maybe let's just try, see if we can get another client. And that was the beginning of the company. So you lost one partner after the first project. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was uh, pretty tumultuous. <laughs> no, he, he, it's hard it to hold sense. on to bass players. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, he was just, it didn't make sense. You know, he was just like, yeah, I mean there, you know, AJ and smart is like this ridiculous thing, which may never turn into anything. And, um, yeah, it didn't, it didn't make sense, which was fair enough. So this may be Quentin Tarantinoing around a little bit in the story, but um, what, what drove you to write the book, The Workshop or Playbook? Oh, wow. That's all the way to the end of the story. Uh, <laughs> no, it's totally fine. Um, so the Workshop or Playbook, so, I mean, that whole workshop topic in general sort of kicked off for me after... So myself and my co-founder were running AJ and Smart, let's say for the first five years as a relatively traditional UX design agency. Meaning, you know, a company calls us, they're like, hey, we need a new app. And we would go there and kind of get a kick, do a kickoff session and then go back to the AJ and Smart office and make their, <laughs> design their app for them, go and meet them again. And then they're like, actually, I don't like this. I don't like this. And, you know, the usual back and forth. And you do a project that lasts six months and in the end, everyone hates each other. Um, and the funny, <laughs> thing, <laughs> the funny thing is, this is how agencies work always. It sounds, it sounds like a lie, but... All the agency founders and owners I know, that's how their lives are. But Our of listeners course they, are all either cringing, laughing, or crying <laughs> right now yeah, because of because, the, the accuracy. You know, you, that's how it is. That's how projects work. You're, you're super misaligned at the start. No one knows what's going on. Frustrations build up over time. And then the project doesn't end with like a party. It ends with like a, it's like a, a balloon that's half inflated, just slightly deflating with a fart <laughs> noise. Um, and so what happened was myself, and my co-founder were like on these multiple kind of annoying, long, stressful projects for, by the way, actually I should say the brands were cool and the projects were cool. So like we were doing cool stuff for cool companies with cool people who we really liked. And it just always still turned out crappy. Like the, I, I even should say the products were cool in the end as well, right? Like mm -hmm. everything turned out fine. It was just like there was a toll. It like took a toll on your brain. Just the endless, uh, like like the feeling. It's emotionally draining. Yeah, yeah, it's emotional. The feeling, you might know it, the feeling before you meet the client or before they come into the room or before you're on the call and you're just holding your fist together, hoping they won't give you any more feedback. That's how it was. Or, or that they've just given up and they're like, whatever, we'll just use that. Um, we so have anyway, another idea. Yes, exactly. My cousin showed me this thing <laughs> since, since the last time we met. And now that's what we want to do. Or what, what happened more often was like uh, another stakeholder would come into the room and they would be seeing it for the first time right at the end of the project. And they're like, I thought we were building something else. Literally, this happened to me at one of my client's offices. Um, the, the sponsor, the person who's actually paying for the project, um, came into the room for the very first time. I didn't even know who this guy was. And he took out his BlackBerry and asked me in a, in a pretty rude way. He was like, yeah, but how is this going to work with the buttons here? And I was like, we were asked to design an iOS app, man. Like. And he's like, no, 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 no. That's not what oh, I wanted. No. And you know, obviously this wasn't <laughs> our fault and it was fine. And they paid us for another few months of making it. But I hated that. I hated this moment. I didn't care about the money. So look, I'm going on a long ramble, but you need to know this context. Um, what happened was myself and my co-founder started getting more and more and more irritated. And we were also blaming the client, which was wrong. This was our fault. So we were like, all clients are stupid. They don't know what a UX is. They're idiots. They don't know what they want. Um, and eventually after like six years of complaining and just blaming clients for everything, we thought maybe actually like either we can fix this or we should quit because we hate doing this. And he was in a band and I was wanting to be a filmmaker anyway. So it was like, maybe we just quit this shit. Maybe, maybe we just hate being designers. Long story short, 
we decided to try to test out. So we went to this conference actually called the UXLX in uh, Portugal. Uh, and there was like this agile session um, at like teaching you how to do uh, build a backlog. Um, and this guy, Adrian Howard, I think was his name. Um, he basically showed us how to do user story mapping um, from this. There's a book called user story mapping um, to build backlogs. And myself and Michael were looking at it and we were just like, could we use this as the way to get everyone on the same page before the project starts so we don't have to have all of this mess? So we tried that. That kind of worked a bit. Then we started learning about design thinking. That kind of worked a bit. And we were slowly but surely getting to the point where the, it was less and less frustrating. And then 2016, March, I'm getting on a flight to fly to our client, Lufthansa. And I'm still feeling frustrated, still feeling irritated. Mm. The, like, I think we've solved like 10% of the problem. Still, I was on this flight heading to Lufthansa and once again, feeling that feeling in the pit of my stomach, like they're not going to like this. They're going to ask us to redo it. Or there's been a misunderstanding that we don't know about and whatever. Um, and I brought this uh, book with me called Sprint from Jake Knapp, uh, which I did not mm -hmm. write. I wish I had. And um, it's one of those moments where I was actually talking about this today to an employee on a different topic, on more of a mental health topic. But sometimes you read a book uh, and, and, and it's like a collection of words and stories that actually release almost like a magic spell. You know, you read it and it's like, boom, a magic spell has happened because you've decoded something. <laughs> and I. I read Sprint on this flight to the client's office. I read half of it on the way there and half of it on the way back. And I was like, this is it. This is what we've been missing. This is the thing that can get everybody on the same page so that we can go and just do our flipping work. <laughs> and so anyway, very, very quickly, um, we decided, we asked Lufthansa if we could swap our kickoff meeting with them with the design sprint, they were totally fine with it. They're, they're a really great team over there at Lufthansa in Frankfurt. Um, hello, everybody from Lufthansa in Frankfurt. Uh, and they, <laughs> did you guys know you were our first design sprint? Um, so we, our first they, victim. Our first victim. Um, I also got to give a shout out to N26 here in Berlin. Uh, we, they, were, they were our actual first victim, but not with the design sprint. We tried to do a design sprint with them before the book came out, but we were just guessing what a sprint was. Anyway, the sprint was an unbelievable experience. We got everyone on the same page. We got all the stakeholders to tell us everything they wanted. We didn't just have to take random notes like we always were. And at the end of week one of the sprint, we basically had briefed ourselves on what the project was going to be. And we were able to work for like six weeks after, hand over the product, and we had no feedback. And we thought that was a fluke. We've been, then we did it. We, we decided every single project has to start with a design sprint. And that was four years ago. And we've never done it any way since then. We refuse to start any product design project or product strategy project without this alignment of design sprints. So in the meantime, I'm getting to the book. In the meantime, what happened was... Clients, so Lufthansa, right? They, you know, the we book would, question was just to jump the water yeah, to get you to talk good, about it's this. Good. You got me, you got me. <laughs> so in the meantime, what happened was, um, so, you know, we did the design sprint and we were like, oh, like this is, I'm assuming you'll just beep out my swear words. I'm sorry about that. I'm, I am actually struggling to not swear here. Um, <laughs> I, I have the so, technology. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, so this is something special, but the special thing isn't the sprint itself. The special thing is the fact that there are techniques that are systematic and they help you make decisions and solve problems. And we didn't know about these before. And so I started getting obsessed with this topic um, we, uh, of workshops. And the cool thing is we didn't even have to think about how to develop it. Clients started, you know, we would do a sprint with them and then they'd call us back. For example, Lego, they call us back and they're like, Hey, we have this like, um, meeting of all of our CEOs uh, next month in Tokyo. Uh, but we only have three hours. But we see some value in this ability to have a facilitator helping us make decisions. Can you come over? And I'm like, yes, I have a workshop for that. Obviously, I don't. <laughs> and so then I had to sort of figure out the, like, how do you design a workshop? How do you like break these like 
principles of building a problem solving and like decision making session and how do you build new ones and so the, the, this um about 2 years ago this exercise called lightning decision jam was born and the reason this exercise exists is because clients kept asking us for 2 hour decision making sessions one day brainstorming sessions they started asking for custom workshops and we wanted to get paid, right? It's not about this emotional journey. I know like Americans love to tell this emotional journey about the reason wasn't because it was about money, but it actually was. Like at a certain point, we were like, well, we can make money out of this. And that led to getting even more passionate about it then because I was like, holy crap, like this actually changes the way people work. And the cool thing was we would run one of these workshops at a company and then they would get obsessed with it. And then they would refuse to do meetings any other way. Mm, and so that's awesome. Yeah, it was, it was really amazing. It was cool. The coolest thing was like, you know, working for a company and then coming back one year later. So I actually, th- this was a crazy experience where I realized it was working. By the way, you probably know this, especially with your podcast. When you're working on something, you don't think it's actually affecting anyone. You don't think anyone's listening. You actually, at least the way I feel, I just think everything I'm doing is a big joke and no one cares. And so when I actually see, <laughs> when I actually see that someone's doing something with what I've, what I'm teaching, I'm always blown away. So I was in, I was in New York, I was doing a workshop for the New York times and I was walking, they were showing me the newsroom, the, the, like the floor. And I was walking past a room and on the big screen in that room was our YouTube channel. And it was a team, a random team that had nothing to do with me being there was doing an LDJ workshop from our YouTube video in New York at the New York Times. And I was completely blown away. And this was like, this was like also two <laughs> years amazing. ago. Um, and so getting to the book, um, I wanted to... So we've got tons and tons of videos on YouTube. I write loads of articles. I've got my podcast. I've got like hundreds of hours of content. But for some reason, it seems to me that a book is more of a a better way to consolidate information. (laughs) I don't know why. Um, So just as a... I actually went to this uh, conference um, actually in Nashville this year. And one of the topics or I I don't know, it just just like this, that one of the guys who was there had written a book. I read it. I loved it. And I was just like, like, I think this is missing just from the AJ and smart story is just the ability to consolidate this information down into something short, into something people can just have on their desk as a reference guide. And I also don't really like writing that much. So myself and my colleague, Laura here at AJ and smart, we wrote it together and it was a great experience. And, you know, once again, I also thought it was crap. I also thought it was pointless and I also thought nobody would want it. So we only printed out about 2000 copies. Um, and then launched it. And then like those 2000 copies were gone in like the first hour. And we've printed like, I don't know, 20,000 <laughs> now and, and it's still going. So I, I didn't... It, it, obviously, people like the topic of workshops, want to be able to do it themselves. And the book, a book is somehow an artifact that people care about. Um, and the book itself is like a one to one and a half hour read. And all it really does is teaches you how to build your own workshops. but you know, that's the book. I didn't write it for any other reason to be, do you want to know the honest reason I wrote the book? Oh yeah, of course. Because I wanted to get more email addresses and I, I wasn't even thinking about like, I just thought it's a good lead magnet. I wasn't even thinking about the fact that people (laughs) would care about this book at all. I didn't, I really didn't care if people thought the book was good or not. Cause I just thought, Oh yeah, whatever, you know, just a quick ebook, get people's email addresses. Then we can sell them the courses, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then as I started working on it, I was like, like, this is actually, it's cool to do this. It's actually fun to do this. And now people, now I see every day on Instagram and on LinkedIn that people are getting this book and actually building their own workshops. And once again, I'm like, ah, why do I keep thinking that people won't care about any of this stuff or won't use it or don't get affected by it? And now for some reason, people want this book. I know there's like that journey map diagram of when you're writing a book and you know, like I'll never write another book. And then like two days later, you're like, I need to write another book. Like we're (laughs) We're, we're working on another one already. Yeah. We're working on it. So actually what happened was uh, this is, this is not even something my own employees know, but you say that this podcast might not come out super soon. Um, We got contacted by an actual agent after they saw, I guess people posting about this book the whole time. Um, And 
now they want us to write like a proper book. The workshop or playbook isn't a proper book in terms of it's a hundred pages long. It's not like there's no like proper editing. It's like just me and Laura writing a book. Um, essentially, it could be like two articles stuck together. Um, but we did print it. We did figure out how to do all of that. We designed the book, but um, we may potentially write a bigger book on that topic. It did feel really know. great though to say, I read a book today. Because <laughs> <laughs> I picked yeah. it up and went... <sighs> yeah, exactly. Like, you, oh, can read, you can read, you can get a very accomplished feeling by reading the workshop or playbook. By the way, we definitely didn't make this book to make money. We make minus money every, some, every time someone buys the physical copy, it's like minus money. But it's still <laughs> cool that people are getting it. Who do you feel like it's written for? Like who's the, who's the target audience for this, this concept? I, my ideal kind of persona that I'm writing this for is someone who works at a corporate or a startup um, and is just sick of being in meetings, but also feels like they're the person who wants to step up and be the facilitator, be the person who can make other people's lives better. So it's not necessarily for the person who wants to like be the center of attention, but it's the person who wants other people to be able to work better, the guide, the person who wants to be the guide. Now, literally, who do we target with our ads? <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> it's often easier for us to convince people who are in the tech and product space to, under, to, to kind of bite and buy this book first, and then they spread it to the kind of employees at the company who may not be interested in that world. <laughs> um. Do you think designers like naturally make good workshoppers or is it better? Like if you're an agency, you're a design firm, you want to introduce this design sprint idea at your next client meeting or in a future client meeting. Is that better served for someone in an account position to lead that or as a principal or, or is it like boots on the ground designer should, should own their own process? Definitely not. It's definitely not related to being a designer. So, um, one of the best workshoppers we've had at AJ and Smart was um, someone like Brittany, who was just helping you know, with our YouTube channel, um, but happened to be someone who's comfortable with speaking uh, to a group. And it's, it's not about... The, that's one very important thing we talk about in the book. It's not about knowing the subject matter. Um, you know, like we get called into... You, you mentioned our clients in the beginning. I have no chance of being able to jump from the UN to Lego within one week and spend all my time researching what they're up to. Um, it's because we're coming in as the guide. You know, we're, we, we are the guides who guide them through the process. We design and then guide them through the process and then leave them with that. Um, it, you do not need to be... I honestly think anyone can do it. Um, you don't even need to be extrovert. Like it, it's not necessary to be loud and extroverted like me. Uh, some of the best workshoppers at AJ and Smart are quite the very quiet people, but it's because it's something you can learn. It's not something you have to be. Now, I mean, look, if you're a natural performer, it's easier. That's all I can say. Like if you if you naturally enjoy, so like project managers and product managers and agile coaches. It takes me one day to make them into a workshopper. Whereas developers who maybe don't feel super comfortable uh, or designers who don't feel super comfortable in front of uh, groups, sometimes it's like more like two to three days to build up some of that confidence. That's still pretty quick. Um, it's, very, it's very quick. It's easy. It's not a... It's weird. It's, it's like one of the most high paid jobs in these tech companies at the moment. And corporates are just catching on to it. And it's not... And it's and it, it's emotionally and physically draining, like it it does take some resilience to be able to do this job, um, and it does you you need to be someone who has a, the ability to maintain energy, um, but it isn't something technical you have to learn. Is there anyone who maybe should sit out of a workshop? You know, is there is there a personality type or a or maybe a common meeting attendee <laughs> who should not be part of this? No. The, one of the great things about workshops, especially in the kind of system we designed is... And by the way, it's not patented, just so you know, like anyone can take everything from the book and just 
call it whatever they want. Um, the, the, one of the big principles, which is also in the sprint book is that you work, even though you're in a group, you're working together alone. So there's no open discussion because one of the worst types of person in a normal meeting is the extreme boisterous extrovert who likes to talk and who can sell ideas, but maybe doesn't necessarily have the best ideas or the most interesting ideas. Um, they will generally dominate the introverts and the introverts will get resentful and stop enjoying coming to meetings or maybe even pull out completely. Whereas in a workshop, everyone's on the same playing field because the facilitator facilitates the conversations. Most of the conversations are written and most of the results are anonymous. Uh, this makes a massive difference to a normal meeting. Um, you know, we, we talked about a couple of those big name clients at the top of the show. Um, I understand you've got an interesting story about this Zero app. Maybe you could fill us in on that. Yeah. So Zero is one of the... Uh, shout out to the Zero team, by the way. Um, the Big Sky Health team. Uh, Zero is one of the coolest things we've worked on over the last two years, and in particular this year, a lot of the stuff we worked on is, is starting to come, is starting to go live. Um, Zero is a fasting app. Obviously, fasting is a is a hot topic right now, especially in um, the West Coast of the U.S., but it's starting to spread. And what I loved about doing that project is we were able to jump in on something that was relatively niche and try to work out how to make it mainstream. And the other cool thing about it is that we were able to facilitate the, you know, the design of that product while the team was being built in that company. So like, you know, we've done, let's say three or four sprints with them over the last three years. At the start, there was nobody, just the, just the CEO. The second time, there was like three people. The, the third time, now it's like 20 people. And the cool thing is that we are able to, as a workshopper, you, without very much context and without needing to actually execute on the work, you can really guide a company or a team through the process of actually bringing out something super successful without, no matter what stage they're at. And, and Zero is just one of these products that it kind of exemplifies it. It's got like crazy reviews. It's got crazy numbers at the moment. Um, there's a lot of stuff I am not allowed to talk about, which I mentioned a little bit before the podcast, but it's just cool to be able to jump in and out of a product like that. Maybe just maybe you as the workshopper are only giving like two to five days per year on that project, but the guidance you're able to give and the momentum you're able to create doing a workshop can last an entire year. I just I just really love seeing that product. I love seeing the things we worked on together last year coming out this year and becoming successful, even though I know it's actually the mainly the team in-house that's doing all the work. And all we were able to do was guide and channel sort of what they already knew and help them turn that into a product. You know, before doing workshops, that project would have been a nightmare. <laughs> it, would have gone, it would have gone nowhere, to be honest. <laughs> so I'm, I'm curious how the workshop piece, the design sprint piece impacts the rest of your <laughs> process as an agency? You know, is yeah. that just a, a front loaded thing at a new project or a new client? Or is that something that happens internally as well as you're working through uh, a project? Pretty much every situation at AJ and Smart where big decisions need to be made, we will run a workshop. And it's not like a rule that everyone has to do it here. It's just that people voluntarily want to do it. They like, for example... Uh, yesterday, we had a workshop to figure out what our YouTube videos for this month are. Like the team would just never think about sitting around and talking it out. And then someone is writing notes and then it's all chaotic and all over the place and no one knows who really is doing what. We always would use custom workshops to get this stuff done for internal projects. For client work, it's super... Like the, the, the way that we structure it is like, you know, there's workshops for alignment, there's workshops for decision making, there's workshops for brainstorming, there's workshops for coming up with strategies. Um, and those are the times where we're doing kind of real time collaboration with the clients. And of course, there's then asynchronous work where we are actually designing screens. And then this is not a workshop. So for us, you know, workshops are not something which replaces every part of work. But anything where you need multiple people to come together and make decisions and make and kind of figure out how to get on the same page and decide what to do next, we do workshops, custom different types of workshops, depending on the scenario. 
I'm curious about um, like a solo preneur or one one man band or or you just need to make a decision yourself. Is is this methodology something that works uh, just on your own or does really. it require no. the team? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I think I, I'd like to say yes. And I did design a workshop that's on YouTube right now called Shortcut Omatic. Um, so I did design a workshop to do sort of, uh, to make decisions by yourself. Um, but what we are talking about most of the time is, you know, a minimum of two people, you know, two people, you can do a workshop. Normally it's from three up. Um, a, a workshop is probably too robust and too, um, time consuming to run if you're just on your own. So at the end of the show, we'll talk about where to find all these things. But um, one of the things that people might be interested in is in the book, you kind of just give some quick examples of how a workshop would work. And here's, mm -hmm. here's a practical recipe and how to, yeah. how to put these things together. Um, how can people take that further? So if, if that setup isn't enough theory for them to, to go design their own next one, do you guys have other resources for that or would you go back to the sprint book or? Yeah. So the cool thing is the, the way we present it in the book is that there's really four keys to becoming someone who can be very flexible and design workshops and run workshops. Number one, you just need to know the theory and that's just how you build workshops. You learn that in the book in the space of one hour, and then you don't need to think about that anymore. Number two is facilitation skills. That's something that takes a little bit of practice, but there's also theory behind it. Um, you can find out a lot about that on our website, workshopper.com for free. Um, the third thing is just the, I mean, so you, you basically have the, the, the first two steps are almost like the foundation, you know, the actual, the baseline for everything you need to do underneath. Um, and then the, the next two steps are basically around actually the, 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 the tactics, like the fourth step, skipping the third step for a minute, because you mentioned design sprints, um, is the recipes. It's the actual things like, for example, the design sprint or LDJ, these are the recipes that you're able to just jump in on and, you know, say, okay, I'm going to use that as a starting point. I'm going to use the design sprint as a starting point for making a three-day version of a validation workshop, or I'm going to use LDJ as a starting point for making like a four-day thing. So it's good to have these recipes. Step three is you break that backwards into just all of the different exercises and just know what all the different exercises are so you can build them yourself. But I think honestly, if you have step one, two and four, you can do 90% of what you need to do to make custom workshops. Um, and step three is like essentially internally at AJ and smart, we have a, a Google doc, which just has like, I think right now 80 of the most common exercises that we use internally when we have to build workshops and they're basically categorized underneath the four headings that we have in the book so that when a client calls us, like my employee doesn't need to, to ask me, Hey, Jonathan, I have three hours. Um, this is what they need to solve. The employees at AJ and smart have this toolkit. They already know how to build workshops. So you basically, if you read the book, you'll have, already the entire theory on how to build workshops and then all the rest of it you can find by just going to workshopper.com or just, just googling different exercises to be honest you'll find it all online for free because none of these exercises are invented by us i mean these things have been around for we're we're just stealing exercises from places which we find interesting um the core the thing that you can the theory that you need to learn, which is very quick, is just the, the basics of building workshops. That cool. was a rambly answer. I'm sorry. I went one, two, four, and three. <laughs> That's great. No, it's very helpful. Um, so as we're starting to wind down a little bit here, we can't let you go without asking you um, what you're most obsessed with. So could be work, could be life, could be whatever. But what do you find that you are most obsessed with right now? I'm actually very obsessed with um, sort of, I don't really know how to say it, but it's, and it's very cliche for a CEO of a company to get obsessed with this, but I'm obsessed with sort of, it's not necessarily mental health. It's just like, how do you 
how do you remain motivated once you've hit certain goals that you've been aiming for for a long time? So for me, obviously, this is obviously way off topic, but I think that's uh, that's fine, I guess, um, for you if I answer the question in a non on topic way. For me, I've been building this company for ten years, and now I've got the systems and people in place where I don't need to manage people anymore. I don't need to do sales anymore. I am really here now to think about the ideas for the future. And definitely that can leave you feeling kind of lost. And it's obviously, you know, first world problem, blah, blah, blah. But a lot of CEOs in my position kind of just sort of lose momentum after a while and get bored and, you know, just start buying things (laughs) and start (laughs) like, I don't know. I don't even know. I think for me, my current obsession is like, how do you stay motivated when you've sort of hit like what is the what is the core of motivation what's the core of you know being excited about things how do i keep excited what are the things that i'm excited about um and for this i'm just reading a lot of books and that's what i do when i when i have a topic and that i'm trying to understand um first of all usually i have about 2 years of having the problem and for the last 2 years i've been thinking like what's really my role here? Like, am I excited about what I'm doing? Am I getting, am I actually bored? Like, am I doing the right thing? And so my obsession right now is definitely kind of, I guess you could boil it down to happiness and satisfaction. And I'm young enough to hopefully avoid a massive midlife crisis, like many entrepreneurs in my position (laughs) get to. Um, So I hope I can somehow learn my way Um, out of a situation like, you know, having massive midlife crisis. Although who knows, maybe I won't. I'm also very obsessed with stationary. That's my second obsession. (laughs) (laughs) Which is a much, much softer answer than that. I thought I'd give you the real answer first. (laughs) Well, you know, Michael Janda and I had a conversation in the previous episodes of this one, or we'll air right before this one. And we were talking about uh, a friend of mine had just kind of randomly told me a couple of years back. He said, you know, this thing called a midlife crisis doesn't have to happen literally midlife. But yeah, his theory was it kind of shows up when you've accomplished most of the things that you set out to do. So yes. like, which is exactly what you just described, like totally the business is there. It's running itself. The sales are running. The team is running. And, and you're sort of looking for what your place is in that world when, when all the boxes are checked. So, uh, yeah. And I think it's a big problem for, I think one of the reasons it's such a big problem for entrepreneurs is that you don't, who, who do you talk to about this problem? Because it's not, it's like a, like your hierarchy of needs is basically checked off. And now anyone you tell this problem to thinks you're the biggest asshole on the planet. (laughs) Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, hey, by the way, I've completed all of my tasks. I've checked off my career and I'm financially stable now. And um, yeah, now I'm bored. But it's it's like, it's, it's a, it's goes deeper than that. It's like a, it's like the, what's the point of life? What's the meaning once you've achieved things? And sometimes I'm jealous of people who have normal jobs and sort of are kind of still like struggling through them, but not thinking that they could break out of it. Because once you break the matrix and start your own thing and you realize you're in the matrix, uh, you basically can't go back and just pretend, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah, you can't, I, I can't fool myself into just being excited about certain things anymore, but I'm excited about that topic. I'm very obsessed with it. Yeah. Um, I seem to think that what Janda and I were talking about um, was just that his focus became giving back. So like, not that altruism has to be the the result of it, but I I think finding out what's next for you, like, okay, I did check all of these boxes, but what's that other big thing that I want to accomplish or would love to have impact on or like you, like you even said with your projects, like sometimes I'm doing these and I wonder like, am I doing anything? Is anybody paying attention? Is yeah. this thing on? Hello? Is this thing on? Hello, exactly. Um, but I think figuring out like, what is that, that other big impact? I want to be, I, I'll leave you with a quote um, that I really like on this topic because as you asked me what I'm obsessed with and when I'm obsessed with something, I collect quotes on topics. Um, and I really like personal nice quotes. 
This is a great so, setup because your yeah. last question was going to be to leave me with some advice for our listeners. Okay. So seek. here we go. Seeking comfort is one of the worst things a person can do in terms of achieving overall happiness. A lot of happiness comes from working towards things, the unknown, and being genuinely nervous about it the whole way. And I think, by the way, this quote is from Joe Rogan. <laughs> he randomly, he randomly <laughs> nice. said it on an episode with somebody and I was like, oh my God, that's exactly... That's exactly my problem. I've been definitely seeking comfort. I've definitely been playing it safe with the business. I mean, also the problem is, dude, you know, people tell you all the time, oh my God, you're doing so great. Everything's so great. Like, it's crazy what you're doing. And so then you get lazy. You're like, oh yeah, maybe I'm pushing too hard. And then you start playing small and then you start looking to be comfortable. And I think that's, that's the thing I'm excited about learning about. What's the balance between being uncomfortable, being kind of scared, being kind of nervous but also not like burning yourself out. You're you're like I shouldn't have asked them this question. <laughs> no, this is this is good stuff. Good meat right here. Um, good meat. Well, I literally have like another half of these questions left to go, so we're not going to ask all those today. Maybe we'll have you back on for for a episode two in the future. Thanks for having me on. It was really cool. I appreciate it. Yeah. So before you head out of here, tell our listeners where we can track down all the AJ and Smart stuff and <clears throat> all the stuff about Jonathan Courtney in the book. Okay. So, um, you can go to, the, uh, Oh, that's actually a very good question. Oh yeah. If you go to workshopperplaybook.com um, or workshopper.com, you'll find a link to the book. Um, and when you get there, you'll have a choice between getting the physical version. Uh, you just pay the shipping. We'll send we'll give you the physical version for free, but you have to pay the shipping. Uh, and the shipping is actually quite expensive. It's like $9. Um, or you can just get the ebook so you can, it's basically, no matter what you do, it's going to be under $10 to get this book. And hopefully it will change your life. <laughs> Love it. Well, Jonathan, I appreciate you hanging out with us today. And thank you for being obsessed with design. Woohoo! Oh, I was supposed to say I was obsessed with design and not my own midlife crisis. Oopsie. <laughs> you may have said it a couple <laughs> times in the show by accident. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Josh. Bye-bye. Okay, kids, that's episode number 147 in the books. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Stop.